Thomas is uh, filled with information, wisdom, um, all things included when it comes to raising capital, uh, structuring your team, and just he's has experience seeing uh, the pitfalls of startups over the years, what has worked, what hasn't, what investors are looking for. Um, so if you have questions when it comes to pitch decks, anything along those lines, uh, Thomas is right here. Thomas, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so we're going to uh, bombard you with some questions here today. So I hope you're ready for that. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we can have a, a free flowing thing going on here today, y'all. Um, so if, if you have questions, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Thomas, and then um, we'll just flow, uh, flow like that. And if you well, don't, I'm I happy, can get I'm happy to follow up just, just to get, since now I got Tiara's feedback, I'm happy to get Thomas's feedback too, um, if that's okay. Go ahead, go ahead, any Excellent. questions you have. Okay, so yeah, so I'm going to be, um, and I'll, I will, uh, I was gonna say, I'll start my video here for a second so you can see me, I look a hot mess, just went for a walk with my dog and my thing is closed, okay. Here I am. Um, so I'm going to be pitching tomorrow um, at the just open demo day. So it's a three minute pitch. I guess my question for you would be, I, I always want to make sure that I'm including the most important information, but three minutes goes by so fast. And so I'm curious, um, you know, kind of on the, on the recipient or investor side, what information you think is most important to get through if you've only got three minutes to give your spiel? Okay, so here's some. So here are some of the uh, key uh, points. First, explain the problem. Okay. Do not start with the solution. First, start with the problem. And then your solution. And the benefits. And then competition. You know, investors do not want to hear entrepreneurs says, we don't have any competition. Okay. Because if you don't have competition, then maybe the product is not really needed. Okay, so so show how your product or your service compares to the competitors, how you're better, faster, safer, whatever. Okay, and then show some traction in terms of what have you accomplished. Okay, another thing is uh, some validation in your traction. Now, sometimes entrepreneurs say, we haven't sold anything. So how can I demonstrate traction when I haven't sold anything? Well, you could have traction without ever selling your product. It could be you have some, what do you call, MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding, with some potential partners who are interested in your technology. Now, Memorandum of Understanding are not uh, what they call, uh, uh, they're not legally binding agreements. It's an expression of interest that they want to work with you. So having a few companies sign member of understanding that they're interested in working with you and learning more about your technology and potentially maybe be beta, those are good tractions to show that, hey, you have made some progress. You have gotten people to be interested. Okay, and then you know, it's also very important to show your team. Okay, sometimes an entrepreneur would show pictures of the team and the title. Well, it would be nice to have a little more. So, with the uh, name of the the team, there should be a little bit of description of their experience. Okay, and then uh, another uh, item you should have is your financial projections for the next five years. And then also, how much money are you trying to raise? And how are you going to use the funds? You know, what portion is going to be used for development? What portion is going to be used for silver marketing? And so forth. And then, of course, last is you should have a slide that have your contact information. So those are some of the key uh, things that, you know, one would like to see in a, <laughs> a pitch. And you can do this in three minutes. Okay. Can I ask a quick follow-up question to that? And I don't know if anybody else here is in a similar situation. So 
Um, right now on our pitch deck, we have the founders. Um, it's basically him and myself, but I'm not technically a founder of the company. Does it matter whose contact information is at the end of the pitch deck? Can it be his or mine if I'm giving, you know, should it be mine if I'm giving the pitch? Well, it would be the person that would best represent the company. Okay. So okay. if you're given the pitch, but let's say you're, you're not the, uh, the CEO, and it should be the CEO that would answer questions, and then the CEO's contact information would be more appropriate. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, so sometimes, for instance, the, the uh, sales and marketing VP would make the pitch because the CEO is not available, but then the question should be just to the CEO. Got it. Thank you so much. All right. Do we have any other questions on here? All right. So, um, Thomas, I'm wondering when it comes to the, to the, the, the registration process and just making sure that you're prepared to receive equity from, um, from investors, how would you go about that process? Um, as far as where would you register your company? What's what, what type of entity would you register, uh, to make sure that you can, um, receive, um, that you could give up, uh, uh, shares in, 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 in your startup uh, sure. yep okay so i always encourage startups to incorporate you know sometimes entrepreneurs say well you know it's going to cost a thousand dollars incorporate so i want to save my money that's not a good idea spend a thousand dollars to incorporate so because when you incorporate you accomplish a few things one is you provide what they call the corporate shield that would protect you from liabilities but also you need to have a corporation so that you can issue stocks because startups okay, need to have stocks to attract people because most startups cannot afford to pay market rate salaries. So the way to offset the lower salaries is to offer equity in the company. And to do that, you need to have your company incorporated. Okay. Yep. Is that is that it? What about where? Yeah. Um, so there's this also thing. also I want to make another point. Be extremely careful that when your company is in the early stage, do not give stocks to investors. Okay, this is a mistake that some entrepreneurs make: is that they would sell stocks to friends and family. Okay, this is a very very <laughs> big problem because typically when money comes into a company in the early stage money comes in a very low valuation that makes it extremely difficult for the company to raise money later on at a much higher valuation so never ever sell stocks in your company during the early stage use what they call convertible note which is debt that could be converted to equity at a later date when a more reasonable valuation can be determined so a lot of times, you know, a startup would take money from friends and relatives, you know, 5,000 here, 10,000 there. And they, if they made the mistake of giving them stocks, it's a huge, huge problem that has to be undone <laughs> at a later date. And I've advised several companies that had that problem where they had sold stocks to early investors at a very low valuation. And I had to work with the company and basically avoid every single stock agreement that was signed and had to create brand new agreements. So, so do not sell stocks. When, so you're now, when you, when you say, when you say do not sell stocks early, are you, what, what's considered early series a precede? No, 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 no. I'm talking about precede. Okay. I'm talking about when, when your company is, uh, you know, hasn't had, uh, significant funding. Naturally, you're going to be selling stocks when your company is raising like one or more million dollars. But when you're raising like, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, that's not the time to sell stock. That's the time to bring money in with convertible notes or safe notes. Okay. And what it is, okay, convertible note is basically a vehicle to get around having to value your company. So investors put money into the company 
as, as a loan, okay? And the loan is converted to equity at a later date when the company is a little more established and when a more meaningful valuation can be determined. So, so especially if you're getting, you know, money from <laughs> like family members, relatives, personal friends, do not take that money in exchange for stocks in the company. Is, is this clear? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, and anyone else on here have questions? Or I could continue uh, asking uh, Thomas here if anyone, if nobody does. All right, so uh, Thomas, we we discussed uh, vesting uh, on a on a previous uh, conversation. Would you uh, brief on that conversation real sure. quick? When it comes to vesting. Yeah. yeah. So let me explain. So oftentimes uh, in a startup, the key founder, I call it the principal founder, may have been working on a project for a couple years, sometimes two or three years, without pay, of course. So. When a founder has worked several years full time without pay, and sometimes the founder also has put in some personal money into the project, then the founder feels that he should have a large ownership, which is justified. But however, if the founder also wants most of the ownership already invested, this becomes a problem. So let's say the founder has been working three years developing the technology of a product. And then after three years, he uh, raises, say, $100,000, $200,000 from friends and relatives. And he invites uh, some team members, like a VP of sales and marketing, or maybe a CTO. And then he starts talking to, uh, actually, it's to be he or she. <laughs> the founder starts talking to investors. And the investor says, so what, what is the... Uh, the equity uh, distribution like. And the founder says, well, you know, I've been working on this project for three years, so I own 60%, okay? And then the uh, investor says, well, how much is this vested? And the guy says, well, I have 60% all vested. And then the investor will say, thanks, but no thanks, goodbye. <laughs> now, so my, my uh, approach is like this. Suppose the founder, has been working three years full time and has raised like one or two hundred thousand dollars from friends and relatives and now is in the process of approaching professional investors to raise some significant amount, maybe half a million, three quarter million, a million dollars. Then the sixty percent that the CEO has should not be hundred percent vested, but some portion, not maybe maybe like twenty five percent of the six percent would be this invested, you know, for the time that he already spent to build the company. But the remaining seventy-five percent should be vested over the next four years. Now the reason is this: suppose something happens, and the person cannot perform the duty of that position, whether it's health or whatever then the invested portion becomes available for that person's replacement. So let's say if the CEO has 60% total ownership, but 25% of that is vested, then the other 75% becomes available if that person cannot perform that function and the replacement is brought in. Okay, the same thing with like if the uh, principal founder also has a partner, maybe he's also been working with another techie for the last couple of years. And the techie has uh, contributed substantial amount of uh, time to develop, say, the product. That the techie, who would be maybe the CTO, would have a portion of his stock initially vested, but not 100%. Because again, if something happens to that person, and that person's position needs to be replaced, then the invested shares becomes available for the replacement. Okay, and then any new hire, of course, would have no vesting, would be, you know, vesting going forward for four years. Right. Okay, so we have some questions in here uh, related to 
uh, safes and uh, convertible notes. It looks like, uh, let's see here, what do you recommend, safe or a convertible note? Okay, since I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> you know, I'm not an expert at adjusting this issue, but based on my understanding, convertible note, okay, typically has a term, has term that the note, you know, expires in certain time frame, typically like two years. Was well, a safe, okay, doesn't have a termination date. And, and also, I, uh, convertible note used as an interest. So there are several parameters with a convertible note. There's usually a discount, there's an interest, and there's termination date. The safe, okay, difference in that it doesn't have a termination date and may not even have an interest. Since I'm not uh, a legally, <laughs> not a legal uh, expert on this issue, I would defer this that you know once you talk to some legal person but that's my general understanding okay let's see if there's any other questions here now we know that um uh investors and uh institutions that that take on cohorts are typically more uh, lean, leaning towards the the the, the end of uh, having a a, a co-founder. Um, how necessary do you think having a co-founder actually helps uh, as far as this, the overall success of a of a startup, or is this just a thing that investors just feel comfortable with? But are there real data supporting the fact that if you have a co-founder, you're you you have a higher chance of being successful with your startup? Well, the, the thing is, it's really the, you know, the team, okay. The, no, the, the team, okay, typically three people with uh, three different sets of skills. So first of all, the number one position is a CEO. What investors like to see in the CEO is the CEO that has management experience that has business knowledge and leadership skills. Now, leadership skills are a little bit subjective because a lot of individuals feel that they have leadership skills when they're lacking. So I would rather try to use the more measurable parameters of management experience and business knowledge, okay? So if a person, you know, doesn't have good understanding of business knowledge, then the person will not make a strong CEO. Okay. So whether or not the person is a founder or comes in later is not as important as at the time that you negotiate with investors, that you have a strong team with these three skill sets, a CEO with management experience and business knowledge, a CTO who is an expert on the technology and very important, a person who understands the market and has proven experience bringing in paying customers. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs do not necessarily share these opinions. A lot of, especially techie type entrepreneurs feel that, hey, I got this really neat design and it's gonna sell itself. It's not gonna sell itself. You really need somebody who understands the market and who knows how to sell. Now, the, the thing is, one should not have a, 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 a product that is looking, or one should not have a solution looking for a problem, you know? So don't develop a product that's really neat if there isn't a need for that product. So it's very important to have someone on the team that really understands the market, really, feel strongly that there is a need for this kind of product, okay? Because otherwise you could have the neatest product, but if there's no need, no need for it, then investors are not gonna come in. Now, there, there's a question that just came um, in related to this right here. Are investors looking at advisors as part of the team uh, the case founders doesn't have strong business management, so he has advisors and board. 
Advisors are good for the company, but they're not uh, key to investors' decision because typically advisors do not take that big a role in a company. Right? Advisors are sometimes, you know, available a couple hours a month. You know, they were so advisors should be pursued from the standpoint that they can contribute in some manner. Like, for instance. An advisor may be an expert in a given technology, or an advisor may have customer contacts, okay? But an advisor is not considered a team member, okay? So investors are not going to make investment decisions based on the quality of the advisors. It's primarily the decision for investors is the quality of the team. Uh, so there's a question that was that actually came in way earlier about advice. It says a, advice about pre-seed, pre-money valuation versus post-money valuation. Well, see, th this is the point I was making. So, okay. So, so let's say you want to bring money into the company. So if you're selling stocks, okay, then you have to determine what is the value of the company before the investment. Let's say that... You're looking for $1 million, okay? So before the money comes in, you value the company at $5 million. So then you will say, okay, pre-funding pre valuation is $5 million. So therefore, every stock I sell would be based on, you know, the company being worth five. But then after you raise the $1 million, now the company's worth $6 million, right? Because if the company was $5 million before the million came in, now a million came in, the company's worth $6 million. But most likely, okay, in the early stage of the company, where you don't have revenue, okay, try to bring money in on convertible note without fixing the valuation of the company. Because you might think your company is worth $5 million, and investors might think your company is only worth $3 million. So rather than argue and try to set a number, delay that <laughs> setting of the valuation number until a later date when you have a little more traction, when you have, you know, more to show for your accomplishments. So we have here, if your projected ARR is $10 million, what should be your approximate valuation? See, that depends. Okay. So for instance, if you're providing a service, okay, then ten million revenue might mean valuation of ten or fifteen million. But if you are a super high tech company, ten million revenue might mean the company is worth hundred million. So how much your company is worth is not just based on revenue; it's based on revenue, technology, uh, what they call uh, cost of entry. You know, how fast can a competitor? So let's say you have a service type business and lots of uh, competitors can rise overnight to provide a similar product, then you're not going to get a very high valuation. But if your product is based on like several years of technology development and it's going to take a competitor at least three or four years to be able to get to a point where they compete with you, then your valuation could be worth many times your revenue. All right, so we have a, a, a new question here. As a founder, um, basically how to avoid having, how to avoid giving out share stocks equity when reaching to the exit stage. So I suppose when, um, I, I suppose when, um, building the startup not getting any outside capital that's what where this this question uh really sources down to right it is basically about not giving out any any how to how to uh not give away any shares but then that would basically mean that no. you're not you know you're not taking no. any money okay so the thing is when when you're running a startup company you cannot afford to pay market rate salaries okay so the way to attract talented people to join a startup and pay them low salary is to offset the low salary with 
equity in your company. So almost all startups have to give away stocks to attract talented people. Because why would a talented person work for a startup at low salary if he's not gonna, he or she's not gonna get some stocks? So if you want a talented person to work for your startup at say 25 or 30% lower salary than market rate, you have to offset that lower salary by offering them stocks in your company. So the people that are willing to work for startups at low salary have to believe in the future of your success, that someday your company is gonna be successful and they can make many times more on the stock than they would on the salary. All right, so we have another one here. Oh, okay, I love the, the questions are firing, starting to come in, I love it. <laughs> all right, so we, <laughs> all right, uh, so we have here, deep tech in AI and crypto have a higher cost of entry to market versus a mobile app or an interface respin of an old biz pattern. How does one express the value of the larger market opportunity if the product has not launched? Well, again, you know, you would have to basically convince the investors that your technology has so many, like, man years of work put into it. And the investors, you know, would have to understand, like, if you have, like, say, three man years of work into your development versus an app that may have, like, three months of, uh, of effort, so, so those would, would determine your valuation. All right. So um, if you need a drink at any point, Thomas, let me know. You can take it. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's continue then. Um, what, happens, um, what happens to a convertible note at maturity? Can an LLC issue a convertible note? You know, uh, those kind of questions, I think, would be best answered by some legal person. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, <laughs> take a, uh, you know, a position. I'm not really good at answering these kind of questions. Yeah, you know, I wonder what the LLC issuing a convertible note. Uh, that's an interesting question there. But if, if, if that were to be a case, I, I suppose... That would only be if, if you were to change the entity, though, right? Because then yeah. there's no what possibility of getting any shares in an LLC at all. Right, right. Yeah, like I said, you know, if you're going to run a startup company, you need to incorporate and you need to be able to issue stocks to attract talented employees who's going to work at low salaries. And in some cases, no salary. <laughs> So we have here, uh, what portion of, of, of stock should the first three employees get after the founder? See, the, the, it's not a question of how, what time from they come into the company. It has to do with what is their worth. So for instance, if three people start a company and one is the CEO, so that not naturally that person would have, you know, a picture. But if one of the three is an engineer, well, then that person shouldn't have a huge amount of stocks because you need to have substantial stocks for the three key positions, the CEO, the CTO, and the VP of sales and marketing. So if a person is employee number three, but if that person is, is like an engineer, that person should not have substantial shares because the substantial shares need to be in the budget for those three positions. So it's a mistake to say that the time frame of joining a company determines the number of stocks. No, it is the position and the contribution that one expects from the person that determines how much ownership. So we could have an engineer join as employee number three with say 1%, we could have somebody join as employee number five, who is a VP of sales marketing with 
because it's it's how much the person is going to contribute to the business that determines how much stock to give to that person. All right. So, do you have any comments on how much equity you should offer a qualified executive? <laughs> Again, that depends. It depends on the person's experience and knowledge and how much they're going to contribute. Now, one of the one of the things that I discourage is the executive title of the COO. Okay, for a startup. Typically, the CEO position is viewed negatively by investors. So oftentimes, when a group of uh, entrepreneurs get together to start a company, so the person with the vision and the, and the business uh, management experience typically takes the CEO position, and the technologist takes the CTO position. And then, of course, if somebody has you know sales and marketing expertise, they take the VP of sales marketing. But then sometimes in a group of co-founders, there's a person who's neither technical nor has sales market experience. So the person says, I'm going to be the CEO. And if the CEO considers this person, you know, a close friend, sometimes the CEO will say, yeah, okay, you be the CEO. <laughs> that is bad. <laughs> because investors look at the CEO position as a position that should not exist. When the company is young, the company does not need a COO. So the CEO is like a red flag. They're saying, hey, I'm one of the original uh, participants in the company, and I'm going to have lots of ownership, but I'm not really very uh, useful. I'm not technical, <laughs> and I don't bring in customers. Then the investor will say, why are you there? So another mistake is sometimes spouses will start a company and one spouse will be the person with the business vision, with the uh, IP uh, expertise, and the other spouse, being a spouse, but not being technical, not having sales marketing skills, will take the role of the COO. Again, that's a dead giveaway that this person is basically not needed. <laughs> So, I do not recommend any startup to have a COO position. And for that person to have that title and have significant ownership is a big mistake. It's a big negative to investors. And also, in general, I do not <laughs> uh, recommend two spouses to be co-founders of the company to have substantial shares. If two spouses feel very strongly that they work in a company, then what I recommend is one spouse being the CEO is fine, but the other spouse should not have an executive title. And the other spouse should not report to the... So if, say, two spouses, one is a CEO, the other one should not report to the CEO. The other one should have a lower position, maybe a director or management position, and report to one of the other executive. So, like... If one spouse is CEO, and let's say they have a VP of sales and marketing, and the second spouse becomes a sales manager reporting to the VP of sales and marketing, that works. But if the other spouse, having no uh, really important skills, takes the CEO role and has tons of shares, it's a big turnoff to investors, and it's a big turnoff to other employees. Talented people do not like to work in a company where the two spouses have <laughs> the two executive titles and have strong control of the companies. Because it's a, basically given investors, we're two spouses, we're the founders, and we're going to make most of the uh, management decision. That's a big turnoff. So in general, I, I do not recommend two spouses to be co-founders. All right. So if we are in an early stage with no traction, can we consider the multiple fundraising rounds of our competitor that are in the same region with the same environment as advantage to show the demand of the business in the region? Yeah. So basically, you know, my point is that 
when you're at that stage of your business, you do not set a valuation. That's why I strongly recommend that your early funding is done with convertible notes because convertible note does not require a valuation of your company. Basically, we're saying the company is so young, we don't know what it's worth. So we're going to delay that question until a later date. No, what I think uh, what I think this question is relating to, Thomas, is basically piggybacking off of another company. No, no, to show the to show the the the. Uh, it, does, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's what the question was initially asking. Right. But yeah, it, it, it. I mean, just the team. See, itself. the thing is, the the thing is, also, sometimes people make the mistake of saying, you know, there's another company. I'll give you an example, okay? A few years ago, my neighbor across the street decided to start up company. First round, $125 million. Second round, $80 million. So a little over a year, he raised over $200 million. But that's not typical. Now, the reason he was able to do that was because he was one of the principal founders of a company that Cisco bought for $6.5 billion. So because he had made many hundreds of millions of dollars of profit for investors, when he decided to start a company, he got $125 million first round. So sometimes startups can raise substantial money without any traction if they have some track record. Okay. There was an example. Many years ago, I was at the business meeting. And the VP of this uh, investment banker told me that he said, one day an executive came to his company and met with the partner of this investment bank company. He says, I have a business idea. And he had a piece of eight and a half by 11 paper. And he starts to sketch his business idea. And the VP of the investment bank company says, I like it, so I'm going to invest $5 million and I'll be your lead investor. No, that's not typical. But the reason the the, the uh, partner of this uh, investment banker made that decision is because of the track record of this guy. Because he had managed some very successful projects. So he believed, even though the guy just had a <laughs> one sheet of paper, he was not investing on the design of the one piece of paper. He was investing on the knowledge and experience of that individual. Okay. Now, some of you people, I'm sure, is familiar with a company called Nest, the smart thermostat. Okay. Tony Fidel was the founder of Nest. When the company was fairly young, I think less than two years old, Google bought it for a couple billion dollars. So some of my business... Uh, Friends asked me, they said, why did Cisco, I mean, why did uh, Google, why did Google pay a couple billion dollars for a smart thermostat? You know, when it had very, very tiny <laughs> amount of revenue. I says, no, Google did not pay a couple billion dollars to buy the thermostat. They pay a couple billion dollars to buy the expertise of the company's founder and his people. Because the people that founded Nest were the people who designed the iPhone and the iPod and Apple. So the investment to buy that company was not based on the value of the company, it was based on the expertise and knowledge of the people in that company. So you can't always compare yourself to other companies. Right. Now, uh, another question here. What is the average percent given to advisors? Okay. One number that I've heard fairly common is 1%, or no, half a percent vested over four years. That's sort of the a typical uh, you know, number, half a percent vested over four years. Okay. My partner and I founded our tech company as an LLC to avoid reporting overhead. We seek to add a financial 
officer to help us obtain private funding. We're thinking of simply adding him as a non-voting member in exchange for 5% with an additional 5% if successful within one oh, year. Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> Okay, now, first of all, I, 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 we, we're not done with the question yet. <laughs> are you, okay. are you, are you saying that it'd be better to convert to a core and offer shares? Okay, first of all, I do not recommend bringing in a financial person, a person with financial expertise, to be a co-founder with an executive title and to have a large percentage. Okay, nowadays, okay. Finance can be done, accounting can be done with QuickBook. So a lot of small companies would hire a young person who works as a receptionist slash secretary slash office manager slash accountant. And a young company can always hire a CFO, a consultant, who will be the CFO one day a month okay, to set up the accounting system and train this low pay person <laughs> okay investors do not value a financial person as a significant executive with significant shares okay so giving out like five percent to a financial person would be a mistake okay all right, so let's see here. I think we're winding down here. Have about eight minutes left. Thank you, Thomas. You you saved us today. I mean, uh, when I got when we got the message from uh, Sal, he's not he can't make it today. Oh, can we get in here? And you saved the day, so thank you for that. All right, so let's see here. Um, other question. All right. Okay, so the the point the the uh point five percent for advisors advisors works but i understand it goes down when new advisors are added and the company moved forward so the point five percent drops that's of course yeah so i also want to point out a common fallacy there are a lot of uh, people in the financial community that represent investment banking expertise okay and these people okay often will try to sell themselves that they can help startups raise money okay and the, the typical uh, arrangement is they will charge uh, you know a consulting amount typically five to six thousand a month for a few months and then they will charge another amount for when the money is raised. Now, in most cases, when entrepreneurs work with these investment bankers, the typical experience that they will pay the five or six thousand a month for two, three months, and they will not end up raising any money. <coughs> it is a fallacy to believe that these financial people will help you raise money. Investors do not make investment decisions based on how fancy the financial projections are. They make investment decisions based on the quality and strength of the founders, the quality of their technology, the market potential. So if the finances are a little bit sloppy, that's not a big problem. So to hire an investment banking person who's going to charge you money to help you do the finance projections is not a good use of your money. And definitely you should not give equity <laughs> to those kind of people. Okay, so um, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions here. How do you value a new type of AI technology, not symbols, based not ml nor deep learning i'm not qualified to answer that kind of question <laughs> all right there's another question here then um let's see here it's a little bit before Ex 
Are there accelerators and incubators that fund outside of the typical cohort recruit program? And if so, do you have advice of any to approach? Yeah, you know, there are some very famous uh, accelerator programs, uh, Y Combinator and 500 Startups. And they're extremely difficult to get in. The typical acceptance rate is around 3%. That means out of 100 companies that apply, three of that 100 will get accepted. And also, the, the, uh, the fee is quite large. They typically ask for, I think, like between 5 to 7% of your company. But however, these two uh, programs are extremely effective in that a very significant percentage of startups that are selected into the programs get funding because they only select three out of 100 that apply. That means that those three they select are pretty high quality, you know, prospects. That means that, that the founders are pretty, uh, you know, experienced people and the technology has, you know, very good market potential. So I would encourage, you know, startups to apply with those. Okay, because if you get selected, yes, you pay a significant amount of equity. But if the end result is that they can help your company succeed, then it's worth it.